Welcome to an episode of Carolyn Talks, where I, your host, Carolyn Heist, speak to film creatives about their work, their their work, the industry, and what inspires them. And today I am joined by filmmaker and writer Blue Song Wan to discuss his new film, Escape from Mogadishu. It's a film set in um, Mogadishu in Somalia in 1991, and it talks about the escape of uh, South Korean and North Korean diplomats who were stationed in um, Mogadishu at the time, but had to escape due to the civil war that was taking place in Somalia at the time. And it's a great film. It's one of my favorite films of 2021. And I appreciate um, director Ru for speaking to me. And today he will also be um, joined by his interpreter, Sharon Che. So she will be interpreting for us. And my first question will be, how did he become involved with creating um, the film? Because I know he wrote the script and he's the director, but how did he, become involved with the process because it's based on a book called Escape by um, the former ambassador of South Korea who was in Mogadishu in 1991 when all of this happened. So, the question is, how did you get involved in this project? How did you get involved in this project? I think it was in the film that Mogadishu was in the Naban Desa Muni Sushin, Tachuri, and I think it was in the film that I read. 덱스터 스튜디오라는 영화사에서 이 이야기를 먼저 개발을 하고 있었어요. 그런데 그때는 제가 이 프로젝트에 관여하지 않고 그저 덱스터 스튜디오에서 이런 소재 이야기를 준비한다라는 사실만 들었었고 어 그때 굉장히 굉장히 좋은 소재고 좋은 영화적인 이야기가 담겨져 있다라는 얘기만 아, 그런 생각만 하고 있, 있었죠. 그런데 그것이 저의, 제가 연출할 수 있, 있는 영화라는 생각은 못 하고 있다가, 어, 그로부터 한 1, 2년 후에 저에게 연출 제의가 들어왔어요. 어, 마치 운명처럼. 그러면서 이 프로젝트에 제가 합류하고, 어, 시작하게 된 거죠. So a company called Dexter Studio in Korea was developing this project, but in the beginning, I was not involved with the project. I just heard that Dexter Studio was developing this film based on the story. And when I heard it, I thought it was a great story and it would make a great film. Um, but I never thought of it as a project that I would um, end up directing. But a year or two after I heard about it, um, I got offered the role of director for this project and it felt like destiny and that's how I began, um, I came on board. But at that time, the film was very different from what I got to see now. 더 자극적이랄까? 어, 그래서 제가 그 대본을 받았을 때 저의 비전으로 이것을 해석하고 만들어낼 수 있는 어, 각본과 편집에 대한 권리를 보장해 준다면 어, 한번 해보겠다라고 제안을 했고 어떠한 계약도 이루어지지 않은 상태에서 저의 비전을 담은 스크립트를 먼저 작성을 해서 어, 그것을 가지고 어, 서로 이야기를 나누고 그것을 그 저의 비전을 허용하면서 본격적으로 제가 만들기 시작했습니다. But the script that I got offered is very different, was very different from the, the film that you see now. It was much more focused on genre elements and it was a little bit more extreme in terms of the plot that the film depicted. And so I uh, told them that if you guarantee that I have complete freedom in with the script and with the final cut, and if I'm able to actualize my vision, um, I would join the project. Um, and before I signed any contract, I wrote a script that reflected my vision that I had for the story. And so I gave them the script and that's when we started the official conversation of me joining, um, the, direct, joining the project as a director. And mm -hmm. they ultimately accepted my vision and that's how I came on board. 
Hmm. Um, could you please explain what you mean by more genre driven? Because this film, your the final product, your film is um, what you would call an action drama. And I do notice, and I did notice that it does have some small comedic and even horror elements, which I thought was like a fun touch in the film. It's very serious, but you do have those fun moments. 그 받으신 각본이 더 장르적이었다라는 말에 대해서 조금 더 자세히 얘기해 주시면 좋을 것 같은데 왜냐하면 현재 모가디슈도 액션 장면들이 있고 그리고 코미디와 호러 같은 장르적인 요소로 엔터테인먼트를 제공해 주기 때문에 그더 장르적이었다라는 건 어떤 뜻인지 궁금합니다. 어, 우선 인물들이 조금 과장될 정도로 그 코미디 시츄에이션들을 어, 만들어내는 되게 그런 씬들이 좀 많았고요. 그리고 제가 받았던 각본에서는 무슨 그 정말 그 소말리아 그 모가디슈의 내전을 가지고 정말 무슨 이렇게 그 전쟁 스파이 전쟁을 배경으로 한 스파이 액션물처럼 무슨 북한의 뭐그 핵무기 설계도를 반군들과 거래를 한다든지. 어, 그리고 마지막 장면에서는 아주 막그 굉장히 감그 관객들의 감성을 자극적으로 건드려서 막그 눈물이 쏟아지게 하는 어 장면들이랄지 이런 것들이 넘쳐나는 각본이었어요. 근데 그것은 저는 좀 굉장히 과하다고 생각을 했었습니다. So the original script contained a lot of scenes where the characters were overly exaggerated and creating the comedy out of the moment. Um, and it felt like an espionage action tale with this material of a civil war in Mogadishu. You know, there was a plot where the, um, the, uh, the South Koreans were dealing with the rebels with the blueprint of nuclear weapons that the North Koreans had. Um, and in the end of the film, there were very sentimental moments that were overly tear jerking. Um, and so I thought a lot of those elements were quite excessive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For me, I thought it would be more fascinating to portray ordinary characters from a powerless country trapped in very extraordinary situations. Um, I agree with that because I do appreciate the fact that the film is more dramatic in the fact that it focuses on the interpersonal relationships between the characters that we do get to know a bit about each one individually. Even the kids, like we do learn that when it comes to the children, the way how they inter- interacted with the Somali children was very um, relatable because like they saw the kids in a different way to the adults. So I appreciate that you that you took the film from that level rather than focusing on espionage or about nuclear power. And like, it's not about that. It's about the people in the situation. So the Tony Hanuga Yonaka to Turama, the Turama talking you sort of poem in the day, Tiki, Ku Imudurgan, Kwangega Taipuigo, character Kegane, the Totunda Araboshiko, Tiki either of Kalyones on the Hangu Gaidri, Somalia either. 에게 관는 관점 어른들과 다른 그 관점을 보여줄 수 있어서 너무 좋았고 특히 이 소재를 갖고 스파이물이나 뭐 핵무기에 관한 그런 거대한 얘기를 하는 것보다 뭔가 좀더 인물에 집중된 얘기를 해주시는 것 같아서 좋았습니다. 말씀하신 것처럼 이미 그 내전의 상황에 처한 도시 한복판에서 어, 고립되어 있는 외교관들이라는 그 설정 자체가 너무나 큰 이야기이기 때문에 거기에서 더 다른 영화적인 설정을 끌어온다라는 것은 어, 그, 그것은 굉장히 위험한 선택이라고 생각을 했어요. Yes, yeah, so as you mentioned, you know, the setup of diplomats being isolated in the middle of a foreign city that is in the middle, in the midst of a civil war, that basic setup itself is very grand. So to bring in other um, other backdrops and settings for the sake of the film, I thought was quite dangerous. 특히 제가 그, 고민했던 것은 사실은 그 전쟁이라는 것이 그 굉, 인, 한 인간이 겪기에 너무 너무 큰 상처가 되는 사건이잖아요. 근데 이것을 그것도 우리가 겪은 전쟁도 아니고 다른 나라에서 겪은 이 전쟁 속에 우리의 주인공들을 등장시킨다는 것이 
그 전쟁이라는 것을 단순히 영화적인 소재나 배경으로 제가 소비하는 것은 아닐까 그것을 단순히 소모하는 것이 아닐까 라는 것이 영화를 만드는 내내 저를 굉장히 좀 고민되게 만들었던 중요한 지점이었어요. And what I really had to think hard about was, you know, if you think about war, war itself is such a huge trauma for the individuals that experience it. And with this film, we're dealing with a war that other people went through. It is not our story. And yet we are placing characters from our country in the midst of this civil war. And so I wanted to be very careful not to just exploit and consume the civil war as a backdrop or as a material for this film. And that's something that, um, you know, kind of haunted me throughout the entire filmmaking process. I was also a 본인들의 그 목숨도 어떻게 될지 몰라서 어, 사실 살아남기에 바빴기 자기 자신들도 살아남기에 바빴기 때문에 어, 그때 당시에 있었던 그 어떤 그 모가드슈의 시민도 함께 구조기에 태우질 못했었어요. 어, 영화를 만드는 내내 그것이 굉장히 괴로웠고 그래서 영화를 보시면 이들이 마지막에 그 모가디슈를 떠나면서 그 모가디슈에 남아 있는 사람들을 바라보는 표정이나 그리고 비행기 안에서 그 모가디슈를 떠나면서 내려다보는 주인공의 그 표정에서 마치 제 마음과 같이 어쩔 수 없이 그들에게 어떤 도움도 주지 못하고 떠나는 그 고통 그들의 마음의 무게 어 이런 것들을 조금이라도 좀 전달해 보려고 관객들과 함께 느껴 보려고 했었습니다. And another thing that really troubled me is that the diplomats who escaped Mogadishu at the time were just so busy ensuring their own survival that they could not take any of the citizens of Mogadishu on that aircraft as they were escaping. And that's something that just haunted me throughout the entire filmmaking process. And that's why you see the expressions on the characters when in the last moments of the film, when they escape Mogadishu, the expression of our main character when he's inside the plane, um, you know, the expression of those characters and those in their final moments kind of reflects what I was feeling um, with the, in regards to this story, the pain and the weight, um, the burden that you feel um, real, when, when you realize that you just cannot offer these people any help. And I wanted to deliver um, and relay that sense of pain and weight and kind of create an experience where the audience can feel it as well. Mm. Um, I definitely picked that up from, I would say, almost from the beginning of the film, because you're, in, you're introduced with um, the character played by uh, Joe In-sung, who meets the taxi driver, and he's comedic. He's the first introduction into this world, and like he's lighthearted, and he's funny, and it kind of grounds you and reminds you these are real people. And then, like, as I mentioned, the kids, but there was the, the very, in the last sequence um, where they're leaving on the bus that you do get the children, especially looking at the other kids, and that made me, that made me think of how when you have war, wars are started by adults, but kids are the ones who suffer. Um, uh, they're the ones who suffer the most because they have to live their life um, going through this war. And these kids are able, the South Korean, no, the North Korean kids, sorry, are able to go back home and they're able to escape this war. But for the Somali kids, they're there. They, they, they have to stay, they have nowhere to go. And you do get that moment of them re recognizing the situation that both um, parties are um, are involved in because like, usually for these kind of films you focus on the adults but I appreciate that you also center the children because children are the ones who suffer the most. Mm. 그런 느끼신 고통과 무게가 영화 내내 초반부터 느껴지는 게 일단 처음 조인성의 캐릭터를 볼 때도 그 택시 운전기사와 다툼을 하면서 코미디적인 순간들도 있지만 굉장히 이거는 현실의 사람들, 일반적인 사람들에 대한 얘기라는 게 느껴지고 특히 마지막에 모가디슈를 탈출하면서 그 한국 아이들이 소말리아 아이들을 보는 그 시선이 담겨져 있는데 사실 전쟁에 대해 생각해보면 전쟁은 어른들이 일으키는 거지만 가장 고통받는 
있는 거는 아이들입니다. 왜냐하면 아이들은 그 전쟁의 여파를 앞으로 살아나가기 때문에 되게 큰 고통의 원인이 되는데 그 북한 아이들이 이제 떠나면서 그 소말리아 전쟁에 남겨진 그 아이들을 보는, 보는 그런 장면에서 그런 고통과 무게가 느껴지고 보통 이런 영화들, 전쟁 영화들은 어른 캐릭터에 집중하기 마련인데 이런 아이들의 시선도 담겨주셔서 되게 좋았던 것 같습니다. 그 영화 속에서 보신 그 마지막에 그서 있는 총을 들고 서 있는 아이들은 어, 총세번 등장을 하는데 맨 처음에 그 바닷가에서 막그 즐겁게 축구하고 노는 그 아이들이었고 그리고 내전이 일어나고 나서 북한 대사관에 그 어른들과 함께 들어와서 어른들이 시키는 대로 가방을 열고 돈과 시, 어, 이 귀중품들을 뺏는 어, 그리고 자기들이 무슨 짓을 하는지 모르고 깔깔대고 웃으면서 어, 있는 근데 그 깔깔대고 웃는 것이 실제로는 그 당시에 소년병들한테 까트라고 하는 마약을 씹게 해서 애들을 약간 환각 상태에 있게 해서 그, 그런 어, 현상들이 벌어진 거거든요. 그리고 마지막에는 자기들이 왜서 있는 왜 그렇게 있는지도 모른 채 그냥 어, 그 모두가 다 그러고 있으니 그 총을 들고 어, 멍하게 떠나는 차들을 보는 그세번 세 어, 등장을 하죠. 그 아이들이 다 같은 아이들이에요. 어, 근데 참그 장면들 그 아이들을 찍으면서 마음이 무거웠었습니다. So the children you see at the end holding up those guns, those children appear in the movie three times. First, you see the children playing soccer on the beach. And second, after the civil war erupts, you see them joining the adults in the in attacking the North Korean embassy, you know, opening up their bags and taking their valuables. And you see these um, children laughing, but in reality, they were laughing because they were under psychedelics. The adults made them take, um, mm. you know, these narcotic substances called katu. So they were under the influence when all of this was happening. And third is, you know, lastly, you see them just blankly staring at the cars that are leaving, holding up the guns, still unaware of what they're doing and why they are um, doing this and so it's the same group of children that you see uh, throughout the film and while shooting those scenes I felt very heavy hearted. 그리고 택시 운전사 같은 경우는 좀 어, 안타까운 비밀이 숨겨져 있는데요. 그 원래는 제 원래 스크립트에서는 그 초반부에 관객들에게 재밌는 모습으로 등장했던 택시 운전사가 어, 영화 중반부를 지나서 본격적인 내전이 시작되고 후반부로 접어들면서 그 한국 대사관과 북한 대사관 사람들이 도움을 청하러 그 양쪽의 그 대사관을 찾아서 갈때그 거리에 있는 시체들을 발견하는 장면이 있어요. 근데 그 거리에 있는 시체들 중에 그 택시 운전사와 그 가족들이 택시를 타고 거기를 빠져 나가려다가 실패해서 시체가 되어 있는 모습을 보여주는 것이 저의 원래 계획이었는데 그렇게 해서 그 전쟁의 참혹함을 조금이라도 더 관객들이 알고 있는 사람의 그런 의외의 모습을 보여주는 것이 저의 계획이었는데 이 배우가 케냐에서 모로코까지 촬영을 하러 온 배우여가지고 너무 먼 거리의 이동을 저희가 두 번에 걸쳐서 할 수가 없는 상황이었어요. 촬영 스케줄상 이것을 붙여서 촬영한다거나 혹은 이 배우를 계속 같이 머물게 하면서 그 우리가 그런 내전의 상황에 이르는 그 날짜까지 기다리게 해서 촬영을 할 수가 없어서 눈물을 머금고 그, 그 장면 그 전쟁 이후에 그 택시 운전사와 가족들의 그 최후를 촬영하지 못한 것이 그것이 참 지금까지도 아쉬운 부분 중에 하나입니다. So with that taxi driver character, there's kind of an unfortunate secret hidden behind that character where, you know, you're first introduced to him um, as this character who provides com comedic relief. But um, as the story progresses and we enter the civil war phase, you see both the South Korean and North Korean delegation going to different international embassies to seek help. And there's a whole sequence where they witness dead bodies just on the streets as they're going out to these embassies to seek help. Um, and 
And so you see the taxi driver gathering his family, trying to escape um, in a taxi together. And um, you see them as dead bodies. That was my original plan to include um, this taxi driver's journey to escape, a failed journey to escape with his family. Um, and I wanted to sort of emphasize the cruelty of war by, by portraying that tragic journey of this character that the audience is already familiar with. But unfortunately, because that actor was from Kenya um, and we were shooting in Morocco, we couldn't really have him come to Morocco twice. Our schedule just, um, you know, did not work out. Um, he would either, we would have either had to shoot those two scenes um, consecutively or that actor would have had to wait until we get to the civil war part of our shooting schedule. Um, but because that was, logistically impossible, you know, I had to hold back my tears and cancel or, or take out um, that sequence. Um, and to this day, that re remains as, you know, one of the regrets of this film. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been talking a, a, a bit about the relationship between the South Korean and the Somali characters. And I do want to get to the South Korean and the North Korean characters, but there is um, something that I found really interesting um, and it kind of caught my interest with regards to language. So there's a character called Sawa, and he is another um, introduction to the Somali people. And he works with the, the delegates, he works with the ambassadors, and he works with the diplomats. And he is, I found it interesting with the way he was communicating because we saw that he speaks Korean, or he at least has a basic understanding of Korean and he can respond in Korean, but the other characters were responding to him in English. Um, rather than um, rather than Somali, so I wanted to ask you about those about those scenes because it happens a couple times throughout the film, and it's something just that interests me with linguistically the way how people interact when it comes to language. So can you just talk about structuring those scenes and why those scenes occur the way they do? The Naman characters, the Sawa라는 그 Somali 캐릭터와 소통을 하면서 하는 장면들이 되게 언어적으로 흥미로웠는데 왜냐면 사와는 한국어를 조금 하고 이해도 하는 사람이지만 한국인들은 영어로 사와에게 어 얘기를 하고요 영어로 반응을 하고요 그게 되게 흥미로웠는데 그 그거를 설정하는 그 과정에 대해서 좀더 말씀해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. 이건 그냥 제 개인적인 <웃음> 경험도 좀 있는데요. 자기가 영화제를 다녀보면 어그 통역을 하거나 할때딱 정신없는 과정에 그 통역하시는 분들이 가끔 정신이 없을 때그 저한테 영어를 하고 상대방한테 한국말하고 이런 이런 경우를 몇번 봤었거든요. 그러니까 언어라는 것이 그 그런 그럴 때좀 되게 재밌는 경험 그 기억이었어요. 그어그두 사람이 오히려 그 자, 영어는 자기들의 언어가 아닌데 어, 둘다 자기들의 언어 근데 영어를 통해서 그 둘은 이어지고 어, 근데 그것이 서로가 상대방이 보다 더잘 들을 수 있는 언어로 대화를 한다면 그 둘의 관계라는 것이 어, 그, 그들이 서로를 배려한다라는 게 그, 그런 언어의 선택에서 표현될 수 있지 않을까라는 생각을 했었어요. 그리고 이것은 아마 어, 제가 미국인이 아니니까 할수 있는 생각인 것 같아요. 그 영어를 사용하는 그 미국인들이 갖고 있는 언어에 대한 생각은 조금 다를 것 같거든요. You know, partially that stems from my personal experience. You know, when I go to international film festivals, there's always an interpreter and things are quite hectic when you have an interpreter involved. And sometimes that interpreter would end up speaking to me in English and speaking to the other person in Korean. So the languages get very jumbled up and it's quite fascinating how that works. And, you know, if you think about the characters in this film, English is not the mother language of any of these characters, but that's how they are connected. That's how they communicate. And you know, the there are various cho linguistic choices that, that they make as they try to be more considerate of the other person. And I think the use of language is, in this film stems from the fact that I am not an American um, using English. I think Americans would have a different approach to English and language in general. So I think that's what 어, 한국인들이 어, 영어로 전달하고 그쪽 소말리아 사람들이 한국 사람들한테 한국말을 떠듬떠듬하는 그 상황의 유머가 너무 좋았어요. 
그리고 그 장면이 되게 따뜻하게 느껴져요, 저는. And more than anything else, I just like the humor that comes from the Koreans speaking to Sawa in English and Sawa speaking to them in broken Korean. Um, I like the humor and I thought it, it relayed a sense of warmth. It does because it shows that they, they've spent enough time there to, to get to know Sawa and it's given and it's also given him enough time to get to know them and to get to learn their language because I think for a lot of people who especially if they if they're not familiar with traveling like I'm from Barbados I the Canada is not my birth my place of birth but I've been living here for 12 years and I've grown accustomed to hearing different languages and I've taken um, language courses I've taken courses in Japanese and Mandarin and French and I've been learning Korean, but it's always interesting to me how people interact uh, linguistically, because like when you're living in a country that it, that where you're hearing a language that is not familiar, you do learn to adapt quickly, but some things you can't, um, some things are harder to, to get. And I think especially in a situation like war, where, as you mentioned, everyone is under stress and like things can become confused. It's interesting to sh see how that plays out under stressful situations on film. And I do agree that if, um, if the film was made by an American, it, the context would be completely different. Mm. Uh, So with this film, there's a very Korean element to this narrative that is uh, difficult, uh, that cannot really be relayed uh, when the film is told in an American way. If you think about the diplomats in this film, the Korean and South Korean diplomats, they're from a generation that were educated that the other party were their worst enemies. North Korea and South Korea, the most antagonistic um, um, you know, relationship that exists in the world. Um, but, you know, when they find themselves in this extreme situation in war, they realize that the other party, supposedly their worst enemies, they're the only ones that they can communicate without having a translator present. They share the same language. And there's a huge irony um, in, in that fact that these two worst enemies are really the only ones that can truly communicate with one another. And I think that's, that's what makes this film very different from other films that deal with characters in civil wars. 
Mm, um, no, agree. And that was actually the perfect segue to my next question, because this is where we get into the, um, the relationship between um, South and North Koreans. And like you mentioned, this, they're, the, most of the characters played by veteran actors are older. And so they come from like a, a generation where the time is, as you would say, closer to when um, South and North Korea separated, where like the country became separated because of um, the Second World War. And the interesting thing with this film is, as I said, at the, as we said at the beginning, is um, uh, focuses a lot on the characters and a lot of this has to do with the similarities between North and South Koreans, because at the end of the day, they are still Korean, they still live on the same uh, on the same land, they still live in the same country, essentially. And you see a lot of that is brought out in small moments in the film, like two characters um, needing insulin, both are diabetic. And then there's the dinner scene, which I love, and it's very small, where you get like then one of the ladies helps the other one pe to peel the perilla leaf so she can uh, pick it up, and then someone else is sharing the tuna, and then they're also sharing the ramyeon, and like this is a dinner scene as a family. If you don't know the context, it looked like they're all just one family, one group together, sheltering together, but it's only in small snippets that you realize these they came from two two countries that are that still have um, some animosity between them. Mm. 그 이제 남북한 관계에 대해서 질문을 드리자면 이 영화가 흥미로운 게 되게 캐릭터에 집중을 하게 되고 결국 우리가 깨닫는 거는 남한과 북한 사람들이 사실은 굉장히 비슷하다라는 거를 영화에서 얘기를 하고 있는데 어 결국은 한 민족이고 하나의 문화를 공유하고 있고 이런 비슷한 비슷함이 되게 작은 디테일을 통해서 관객에게 전달됩니다. 특히 그 저녁 식사 씬에서 깻잎 뭐, 어, 떼는 거를 도와주거나 뭐 라면이나 참치를 같이 나눠 먹거나 그이 맥락을 모르는 사람이라면 그 저녁 식사 씬을 보고 그냥 한 가족이 같이 밥을 먹는 거라고 음, 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 이해할 음. 수 있는 것 같은데 그게 굉장히 작은 디테일들로 드러나게 됩니다. 음, 그... 제가 이 영화를 만들고 나서 그리고 특히나 지금 이런 인터뷰를 하는 과정에서 되게 반가운 것은 어, 다들 눈에 보이는 큰 장면이 아니라 그런 세부적인 장면들에 대한 어, 어, 어떤 그 반응들을 해, 해주시는 것이 만든 사람으로서는 그, 대단히 좀 어, 기쁩니다. 음. So what's been great, you know, during these interviews after I, um, ever since I created this film is that people seem to focus not on the big spectacles, but these scenes, very uh, subtle scenes filled with details. And as the filmmaker, it's been very gratifying to see people be so receptive of um, the subtleties in those scenes. When I was making the film, everyone was thinking about the scenario. 큰 장면들은 어, 저의 저 개인적으로는 그 그것이 영화적인 승부수를 걸 만한 장면은 아니라고 생각해요. 왜냐하면 모두가 다 중요하게 생각하고 모두가 다그 장면을 잘 만들어내기 위해서 노력하고 있기 때문에 어, 사실은 감독은 음, 아주 잘못되지 않게만 잘그 선택하는 일만 so when I create films in regards to those big spectac um, spectacle scenes that are planned out since the screenwriting um, phase, I don't think they're the most critical and decisive moments in a film because all filmmakers focus on those scenes, want to make sure that they turn out well, put an effort to it. And I think that as a director, um, my job with those scenes is to just make sure and make decisions um, to make sure that it doesn't go wrong. Mm. Uh, 그냥 지나칠 수 있는 장면에서 거, 거기에서 저는 감독의 개성이 드러난다고 생각하는 편이에요. I think the moments that really reflect the director's personality is those very minute and trivial moments that you can easily just gloss over. 사실 그 밥상에서의 장면은 저의 아주 개인적인 어, 기억들이 많이 녹아 있는 장면입니다. That dinner scene actually carries a lot of personal memories. 한국은 어, 서양과는 다르게 어, 먹을 음식들을 그 테이블에 있는 사람들이 함께 어, 먹는 식이에요. 그러니까 하나의 접시에 담아서 자기의 개인 어, 음식을 먹는 방식이 아니라 
그런 반찬들을 깔아놓고 함께 거기에서 수저와 젓가락이 오가면서 먹는 것이 그 한국의 식탁 문화입니다. 물론 이 지금 같은 코비드 팬데믹의 상황에서는 굉장히 위험한 문화이기도 하죠. So unlike the West, in Korea, people share um, dishes together. It's not like everyone has individual dishes where they put in their own portions. We have various side dishes and pots of um, food um, that people reach out uh, to get. So constantly you see, um, you know, chopsticks and spoons and utensils going all around the table. And of course, you know, in this pandemic, that is a very risky eating culture to have. 한국에서 그 가족이라는 표현을 한그 가족이라는 다른 표현 중에 식구라는 표현이 있는데 이거 이것은 함께 그 밥을 먹는 그 음식을 같이 먹는 입이라는 표현이거든요. 그 그것이 가족이라는 다른 표현 그 한국식의 표현 중에 밥을 같이 먹는 사람이라는 표현이 있어요. 그러, 그렇기 때문에 한국에서 밥을 먹는다는 것은 사실 굉장히 누군가가 밥을 먹는다는 것은 Uh, so in Korea, we have a Korean um, word for family that basically means mouths that eat together. And so uh, the Korean understanding of family is just, you know, people who share meals together. So in Korea, if you share a meal with someone, it means that your relationship is, you know, developing to another uh, more intimate level. 그래서 누군가가 자기보다 좀먼 거리에 있는 음식을 집으려고 손을 뻗을 때그 음식과 가까운 사람이 자연스럽게 그 거리가 먼 상대방에게 접시를 바꿔준다든지 이렇게 밀어주는 행위는 한국인들의 식탁에서 굉장히 흔히 볼수 있는 광경이고 저는 어려서부터 저희 할머니를 통해서 그런 것이 굉장히 익숙했기 때문에 그런 것을 그 아무런 말 없이도 이 남한과 북한 사람들이 같은 문화를 공유하면서 이 살아가고 있다라는 것을 표현할 수 있는 가장 좋은 방법이라고 생각을 했어요. So in Korea, you know, when someone sitting away, sitting farther away from a particular dish and reaching out, it's very customary and natural for the person sitting close to that dish to, you know, push that dish closer to that other person or maybe um, put some on their dish themselves. It's a very common sight at a Korean dinner table. And ever since I was young, I was very familiar with that eating culture uh, from my grandmother. So I thought that it was a very effective way to relay this uh, sense of similarity between the South Koreans and North Koreans without any uh, verbal communication. Um, no, I get that. Like, in my culture, Western and Caribbean culture is the same way. Like when we all have like communal dinners and communal lunches. And that scene is very, like, as I said, it's kind of like, a, if you forget the context, they all are like one big family. And a lot of that actually kind of plays out not only in how they share the food, but in the characters. I want to ask you know about the characters and the cast because that scene like it, like these are touch tones throughout the film but that scene brought through a lot in like family dynamics because you have like the two older brothers sorry i'm trying to get the the cat the so one is um played by join sung and the other one is played by ku kyo wan and that's kang dae jin and tae jun gi and they're like the two brothers fighting like they're like well their <laughs> families at the dinner table they're fighting and bickering over things that they shouldn't be and then there's the the ambassadors who are like the fathers and they're just like trying to like figure out uh, what is what is the next step for the family and then there's the mothers and then there's the kids so like we, you talked about the food but now talk about the family dynamics that you instructed in that scene because like at the beginning they start out as like you could say like almost like families from two from like if you if they got married 그래서 어 이제 그 음식으로도 이 가족 같은 분위기를 조성하지만 실제 캐릭터들의 관계성도 되게 가족 같은 면모가 있다. 조인성과 구교한 캐릭터는 약간 항상 싸우는 두 형제 같이 느껴지고 그 남북한 대사들은 어, 두 가정의 아버지처럼 느껴지고 그래서 그그 그 저녁 식사 장면이 사실 두 가족이 같이 식사하는 것처럼 느껴지기도 했습니다. 음 아, 아주 제 어, 의도를 잘 저, 이해해주고 해석해. Uh, I think that's a great uh, way to understand the film, and that's something that I, I intended uh, for this narrative. 그런 모습을 통해서 이들이 특별한 어떤 집단이기보다 
이 영화를 보는 관객들이 어, 자신들이 알고 있는 어떤 환경, 어, 자신들이 자신들의 삶과 아주 거리가 멀지 않은 어, 어떤 그 환경처럼 느껴지길 바랬었어요. In that sense, you know, if you think about these two uh, delegations, they're not extraordinary groups of people. I wanted the audience to feel like these characters are. In, in, in an environment and in, in relationships that the audience is familiar of, that is not too distant from their own lives. Um, yeah, I love Alex. Like clearly, you can figure that. I I love that scene because what I what I think about the film is while some people may focus on the action and about the politics, I think it's a very more character driven film than anything else, and it's about these people. And from the like talking about family dynamics at the beginning, it like I was saying, they're they're kind of like two two families, two strange families who are brought together in ex under extreme circumstances, and they bond. And even though the bonding only takes place overnight, they get to know each other very well and because they also come from a similar culture like the same dishes same cultural background the dialects might be slightly different because i know there's a difference between north and south korean dialects but they still have that commonality but then unfortunately they have to separate and when when that separation comes that's also when the reality of the situation comes in that they have to go back to their country and their and but their country is not unified and that's another thing i think the film is talking about too it talks about the war in somalia but then it's also talking about the the separation of korea itself mm. 그래서 이, 여, 이 영화를 보면은 처음에는 그 서로를 모르는 두 가족이 같이 이제 모이게 되고 극한 상황 그, 극한 상황 속에서 서로 친밀해지고 서로를 더 알게 되고 그래서 이두 집단이 가까워지는 한 가족이 되는 가정을 보여주는데 결국에는 어, 헤어져야 되는 그런 안타까운 사실에 직면하게 되고요. 그래서 이두 두 가족이 각각의 나라로 다시 돌아가서 서로를 다시 볼수 없다라는 그런 그런 비극을 보면서 이 영화가 사실 소말리아 내전에 관한 영화긴 하지만 어, 더 깊게는 그 남한과 북한의 그 분단 국가라는 상황을 어, 상황에 대해서 얘기를 하고자 하는 게 아닌가라는 생각이 듭니다. 그렇죠. 어, 그것이 가장 중요한 포인트죠. 어, 저는 어, 이 영화의 그 소말리아의 내전에 고립돼 있는 외교관들의 이야기를 하면서 어, 결국은 그거 결국은 그것을 통해서 현재의 우리를 자각하고 바라보는 것이 어, 더 중요하다고 생각을 했어요. Uh, the point you mentioned is the most important point of this film, you know, through this narrative about diplomats who are isolated um, in the midst of a Somali civil war, I wanted the audience, the, the present audience, to become more aware of themselves and reflect on the present moments. Our film was released in the United States in the United Afghanistan so when this film was released in Korea, that was when Kabul fell um, and the whole thing erupted in Afghanistan. 30년 전에 이런 외국에서 내전이 발생했을 때 한국은 구조기도 보내주지 못했고 외교관들은 정말 자신이 어, 살아남기에 급급한 어, 다른 어, 더힘 있는 나라의 도움이 없이는 생존하지 못하는 정도였는데. 30년 후에 어, 이 카불 사태가 발생했을 때는 우리나라에서 구조기도 보내고 어, 그곳에 있는 우리를 도왔던 그 카불의 시민들이 탈출하는 것을 돕기도 하고 할 정도로 바, 어, 변했어요. So 30 years ago when the Somali civil war erupted, Korea was unable to send aircrafts and the diplomats had to find their own way to survive um, and had to rely on more powerful nations um, uh, for survival. But 30 years later, now that now with Afghanistan, Korea was able to send aircrafts and help citizens of Kabul escape. And so a lot has changed over the past 30 years. So, Hajiman. 30년이 지난 이후에도 어디선가는 계속 전쟁이 벌어지고 있고 남한과 북한은 여전히 어, 휴전선이 그어져 있는 상태고 어, 그리고 소말리아는 여전히 정치적인 혼란 상태에 있습니다. 음. 
But 30 years later, there is war constantly going on in parts of the world. Uh, North and South Korea still have a ceasefire line. We're still in war. Um, and there are tragedies that are happening all the time. 자, 그래서 우리는 우리가 사는 세상은 좋아졌는가? 우리는 좋아지고 있는가? 에 대한 질문이 되게 중요했어요. 이 영화가 끝나고 나서 어, 관객들이 그런 질문들을 가졌으면 어, 하는 것이 저의 생각이었습니다. And Somalia is still in the middle of political chaos. So an important question that I wanted to the audience to ask themselves after watching this film is has the world actually gotten better? Has the world improved? Um, and that's a question that <laughs> seeing how the world has gone, not quite. Um, so this is my last question. I appreciate every um, every answer that you've given me. And for you personally, what has this, you've talked about what you want the film to teach the audience, but what has this film taught you personally as a creator, as a director, and then also just as just as a person yourself who, who have who's living in the world that we're living in now? Mm. 그, 어, 개인적으로 이 영화를 만들면서 창작자로서 연출가로서 그리고 그냥 현 시대를 살아가는 한 개인으로서 어떤 것들을 배우셨는지 궁금합니다. 어, 일단 이 영화를 만들게 되면서 저는 이 영화를 만들기 전에는 이 사건 자체를 몰랐었어요. 이 영화를 만들게 되면서 어, 이 사건을 알게 됐고 어, 이 영화를 만들면서 그 외교관이라는 직업을 가진 사람들이 어떤 삶을 살아가고 있는가 그리고 어 우리 그 제3세계를 바라보는 어 저의 태도는 어떻게 어그 가져야 될 것인가 어 아프리카의 역사에 대해서 또 공부를 할 기회가 됐고 어 그런 부분에 대해서 제가 앞으로 어떤 관점을 가져야 할지에 대한 생각들도 많이 갖게 됐고 한편의 영화를 만들고 나면 사실 그 감독들은 생각이 더 많아집니다. 정리가 되기보다 그리고 이렇게 이 만든 영화를 가지고 다양한 관객들을 만나고 반응을 얻으면서 숙제가 많이 생겨요. 그리고 그것에 대한 정리는 아마도 저의 다음 영화에서 그. 그 영향이 보여질 것 같아요. Um, you know, so first of all, before making this film, I was not aware of the historical incident events surrounding the Somali Civil War. So I was able to learn about that part of history and also really understand um, diplomats and their profession and what they go through. And also, you know, it, it gave me an opportunity to really think about my attitude towards developing nations. I was able to, to study the history of Africa and really think about what attitudes and perspective I should take on, on the continent and other similar nations. And you know, as a director, after making one film, you realize that you end up having more complicated thoughts. Um, it doesn't really, you don't really come to a conclusion with all these sprawling thoughts and also meeting various audiences and seeing their reactions to what you have created actually gives you more homework to figure out. And, you know, I think my next film will, will be a reflection of how I deal with this homework that came from this film. And that will influence what I create in the future. Thank you so much. This has been a great discussion. This has been a great interview. Thank you so much, Director Liu. And thank you so much, Sharon, for your interpreting, for your interpreting your rock star. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm glad to meet you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so happy to meet you too. So everyone, that was my episode of Caroline Talks with director Ru Song Wan for his new film, um, Escape from Mogadishu, which as I said, I, I first saw at the New York Asian Film Festival, but it has shown at, at multiple film festivals throughout the um, season. And it has won multiple awards, including for best film and best director at the 42nd Blue Dragon Film Awards. And I just hope that he continues to win more because this is a great film. It's one of my favorite films of 2021. The cast is amazing. Um, thank you so much to director Ru for talking to me. And uh, as I have to keep mentioning um, um, interpreter Sharon Ch um, Che, because I think it's important that people acknowledge the work that interpreters do. This is not an e that is not an easy job and they do it spectacularly. And everyone, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Caroline Talks. 
And please, if you if you're listening to this in podcast form, you can find other episodes on butwhythepodcast.com as well as on other streaming platforms, including um, Spotify. You can find my other podcast, Beyond the Romance, also on Spotify. And you will and if as I said, if you're listening to this in podcast, you can find the video format on my YouTube channel under my name, Carolyn Hines, that's C-R-O-L-Y-N-H-I-N-D-S. You can follow me on social media, Twitter and Instagram at Carrie C-N-H-12, C-A-R-R-I-E-C-N-H-1-2. Follow my hashtags, Dramas with Carrie and Saturday Night Sci-Fi, where I live tweet the dramas that I'm watching. And for Saturday Night Sci-Fi, the shows and films that I am my co-host and our peeps, as I call them, um, are live tweeting every Saturday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. Um, I think that's it. You, oh, you can also find my episodes of the African American Film Critics Association Virtual Roundtables also on my YouTube channel as well as on the AFCA website for the full interviews. This has been amazing. I hope you guys enjoy this conversation and this interview will hopefully also be in print if not if it's not in print by the time I publish this. And until the next episode of Carolyn Talks, everyone, please stay safe. Mm-hmm.